How are you? I'm great. Excellent. Excellent. We were just uh, just running some jams. That was the uh, that was the Vendetta remix, right? Of Reload. Yeah, yes. man. I love Vendetta. They were just on this show uh, not too long ago. Oh, yeah. They are they're so great, and so warm and like sweet. Yeah, they're they're yeah. the best. Yeah, I just saw them in person actually. They were the first like social event of any kind Mm -hmm. I went out to since the pandemic. How how have you been with all that? Have you been getting out there? How was your quarantine and coming out of it? Well, uh, first of all, yes, I have been out. Um, I, my first little big, my first big show was like, I think green velvet at in Arizona at shady park. So yeah, yeah, yeah. it was pretty intense to be honest. Cause like, you know, I was just like, I haven't seen people. I kind of developed like a little bit of social anxiety during um, the pandemic. And like, I'm pretty outgoing. Definitely over the years, I've developed like more of a, you know, more of an outgoing personality, just kind of like, you know, constantly around people. But like not being around the pandemic, like put me back my little, my little head, my head, my introverted self. So, which is good. I actually liked, I actually liked the pandemic a lot in a lot of ways because I felt like I, I got to rest. That's interesting. I think yeah. that's actually really interesting. I, I mean, I was just talking to uh, to my sister in law actually about how we all kind of reassessed priorities a little bit, and and it was almost like what I said to her yesterday was I, I almost had to sit down and take it take it all the way to the bare bones of like what do I like again? Like what do I like yeah. to do? Yeah. You know, like, like I feel yeah. like I kind of lost track of my identity a little bit in that weird year where we were all just locked down. Yeah. Yeah. No, I did. I completely lost it all, but also like discovered that discovered things I needed to do. You know what I mean? And like, yep. kind of like organize myself in a way that I hadn't and just get back to my soul and, you know, little, little intimate parts of me that I used to really enjoy. And it, the way that I used to attack being creative, like, I feel like that is stuck with me. And like, I hope to take that now in the future, now that we're back, you know, that's really interesting. I mean, can you can you as much as you'd like to share, talk a little bit more about that? Like how, you know, any of those experiences or realizations during the pandemic has kind of changed your creative process or the way you're thinking about music? Yeah. Well, before when, so before I started doing music full time, I was just sitting at my house a lot and just like really just playing music all the time, whether it's like producing or, you know, picking up my guitar, creating all these like rich, like deep, almost sometimes sad, like, you know, for my subconscious. Cause like I, I'm pretty uh, an emotional person in a lot of ways. So um, yeah, I think, I, I miss that part of me, you know, I, I miss that intimacy that I would have for my, with myself to, in order to create some real, real, you know, strong art. So I think, yeah, yeah I think, I think I feel n- now that we are back moving, I still, I still remember, like I have this like now this nice muscle memory about how I'm supposed to attack my new upcoming, you know, endeavors essentially. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. And and I definitely want to talk about all of those upcoming uh, <laughs> endeavors as well. Yeah. We'll we'll get there. But uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, maybe maybe we should start off talking about um, what we were just listening to in the chat beforehand, which is the the Reload Remix EP, which just yeah. just dropped, right? Yes, today. Today. Yeah, today. Yeah. yeah. Today's it's, the day. The, the, no, it's, it's great. And yeah, I, I've been listening to this for a while. Such a cool... EP, such a cool concept behind it. I, I feel like just for the people who who might not know, people who are watching now or people listening back later, let's talk about the song Reload for a minute, the original yeah. song mm-hmm. and and kind of what what came, what happened to to make that song a reality and sort of how how it's evolved since then, because I think it it came about at a very important time in in 2020. Mm -hmm. And then even since then, like I listened back to it today Mm -hmm. and uh, I don't know, it sounded different today than it did, you know, a year ago, if you know what I mean by that. Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. Um, Well, it started off kind of, this is kind of wild that this is all kind of aligning now, but um, 
it started off in October, like 2019. It was after the Amber Geiger uh, case where she basically killed somebody in an apartment. Um, and she was a cop and she yeah. killed somebody with, for no reason. Off duty cop and walked off into duty a cop, guy's exactly. house. Yeah. yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah. So, um, and then a few days later I had a, had a session or, I mean, I had a session with, um, Christophe and Coyle who are wonderful friends of mine and amazing songwriters and producers. And, um, we, I don't know, we were just feeling emotional about, about it. And like, I was just like, we need to write some sort of like anthem, some sort of rebellious, you know, like almost like, uh, you know, that song, um, war, good, what is it good for, yeah. you know? Yeah, absolutely nothing, you know? So <laughs> a little bit of that. And then also some Prince vibes and funk. And I was like, I don't know. I feel like the world needs this kind of black people need it. You know, we all need it, you know? So we just sat and, and wrote it and it came out almost like a premonition of the future and what happened in 2020 and the protests and everything. Right. So it's kind of crazy that, you know, that foreshadowed that. And then, so in the wake of the, the protest, it kind of, I, I mean, I have been reluctant to talk about this experience, but, um, I, I had also had my own, you know, experience with police brutality in which I was tackled to the ground and it was crazy. And honestly, I was on my stomach the same way, you know, George Floyd, Floyd was, I could have easily wow. been a person that could have been dead, you know? So, um, yeah, it, it kind of hit home and I was kind of, yeah, I was a little bit reluctant to put it out and just kind of sensitive. And I, you, sometimes you have that, like, do I want to be too political? Blah, 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 you know, all right, these things of in your head, especially with me, I'm always, I'm very encompassing and, you know, being a part of dance music every, you know, it's always, you know, you and everyone. So yeah. I, w I didn't want to feel, you know, isolated, but I felt traumatized and there's some trauma that I, I never really like, you know, let go of. So, um, I decided to put it out and, and create this sort of with, along with this guy, his name is, uh, Naaman Basil. He's an amazing animator. Um, we sat for like four months going back and forth on this, this animation. And it, for me, it was kind of to make the, the nature of the, or the content, you know, the seriousness of the song kind of make it a little bit light, you know what I mean? Right. And kind of zany. Um, so for me, that was like kind of cathartic and to see it co come to life that way. Like it really, I don't know, it's helpful and it continue, it continues to be helpful. And then I got on this whole thing, like we need to keep this message going forever. So. Yeah. Oh yeah. man. Yeah. I, I love that you said that. And it's, while I was listening back to to the original version of Reload today, I was really thinking. I'm I'm really glad that you brought up that war. What is it good for? You know that mm -hmm. that kind of vibe because it really did feel to me like like an older generation of protest songs. Like it had that kind of spirit yeah. in, in a way that I feel like we don't see a lot of in in modern day music. Yeah, and, and that's something I really wanted to dig into with you and to ask you about is. And especially, I mean, first of all, I'm so sorry you had that experience that, uh, you know, can't even imagine what that must have felt like. But then it's almost it's so wild to me to have an experience like that and then to put out something that ultimately it feels uplifting mm -hmm. about it. You know, mm -hmm. like, can yeah. you talk a little bit about making this, I'm oversimplifying, but making happy songs about sad things mm. about dark subject matter? Mm -hmm. um, well, I think it comes from me just being crazy, crazily emotional. And also on the complete flip side, I'm very sarcastic and funny. Mm. So those two things exist in me all the time. Like so intense. Like I'm always <laughs> like, I could be in an intense room of like really serious things and just like crack jokes. You know what I mean? Just cause yeah. like, I think it's just how maybe it's my life's path. And I'm, I'm, maybe it's some of the internal depression that I went through for, for a long time. You know, I, I'm not sure what, what makes it so that these two things exist so heavily. So it comes out in my music, you know, where, where I can, I do it. I realized I didn't know until like I started to see music, my music laid out. I'm like, Oh, I do this a lot. You know, like mm. I love to put serious, serious, serious content with, something that is uplifting because ultimately I feel that's where we're all trying to get to. We, we're, we might be in these dark places, but like 
we want to be happy. We, we really do. Yeah. And there are so many conditions that we have that don't allow us to be happy and we don't have the tools to get out of it. And so also within that, I try to help people in the music have some sort of tool. And to me, music is a wonderful, wonderful tool. Not the only one, really, it's not right. the only one, but it's a way that I can help, you know? Yeah, I think that's right. And I think it, it's so great. You know, you said earlier, you know, sometimes you have that thought, like, is this too political? A am I excluding people by making a statement? You know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, then you, a song like Reload, to me, it, it solves that issue. And it's something that I, I hope other people in dance music are paying attention to. Because I'm sure you know this as much as I do, yeah. how nervous, especially, you know, I come, I come from a DJ background, a producer background, mm -hmm. and from that end, that's always what I hear. It's just like, oh, you got to, you know, management is telling me not to be too much on one side or the other, not to, you know, yes. let's just keep the money going, you know, all sure. that kind of thing. And it's, it's very frustrating to me. Yes, because it really is. And then you make a song like this, I guess is my point. It, it, and then it's so obvious. It's like, this is a song everybody can just sing and dance to together. Yeah. Which is what all you other people are doing anyway. So like, why not make it about something? <laughs> yes, exactly. And also going back to what you said, sometimes, you know, like you want to stay middle of the road type of thing. And may, it may not just be for your managers and your money, but sometimes you stay middle of the road because you don't want to be exposed. Cause like, Sometimes, mm -hmm. so for instance, today on Instagram, someone was like, oh, that's funny that, you know, you're talking about being oppressed, you know, here in America, but people are being sold all over the world and, in you know, different places. And I was like, then I, at first I was like, well, oh, you know, you go through this whole process. Blah, blah, blah. And, <laughs> right. but I was like, did I do something right or wrong? Yeah, this is for everybody. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? so like, but then it made me think, I was like, you know what? I was like, this is my experience. You know, this is, this right. is something, this is all I know. I don't know. I'm not living the experience for people all over the world. You know what I mean? But this is a, to me, a nice foundation to share what I know. And, you know, if it relates to other people, which I hope I actually intend for it to, you know what I mean? That is my goal. Right. Um, then, you know, this is not just about, especially with the term when we're fighting, we're fighting to stop a war. That's like, that to me is very universal. We're fighting to stop like, but we're, we're fighting to stop people from hurting us. You know what right. I mean? Like that's the overall, to me, the consistent. Yeah, it's, it's hard like not it. to relate to that statement. Yeah, you know? exactly. So it's like, it's, yeah, it's about starts. It starts with, yes, I'm thinking from a black perspective, but it's really all of us. It's really all of us. So I so agree. Yeah. yeah, I agree. And I, I mean, it's okay. So, you know, take that Instagram comment of, you know, here, like, there's there's worse things happening, right? Yeah. And and it's like, oh, that's sure, okay. But you know, if if you want people to pay attention to to these things that are going on, like they got to start somewhere, right? So yeah, it's like if absolutely. if somebody can relate to your perspective, then maybe that opens them up to start relating to other perspectives. You know, yes, something yeah. that they hadn't considered. I, I I mean, to me, it's it's always funny because. I mean, the, we can go on and on. This is a whole separate podcast about the internet and social media <laughs> and, and trying to do good on the internet. But, yeah, uh, you know, it's, it's always a, a push and pull, right? Because everybody wants something different out of you when you mm -hmm. come out and take a stand for something or when you yeah. put something out there. Yeah. And I, I mean, I guess for you, have you, especially since you've started, you know, you said you kind of figured out that your your mission, something you really want to do is to to be involved in these issues and to bring them to people's attention and talk about them, all that. Have you found any any good ways for yourself of staying centered, staying on your values and the things that are really important, you know, internally to you? when all of a sudden you're putting stuff out there and now everybody has an opinion about it? Yeah, sure. Um, so first I'd like to say that during 2020, I, I had an awakening that allowed me or that the notion to actually talk openly about all of these issues. But before even I was oppressed and with my own like, you know, um, 
safe, this to be safe. You know what I mean? Like, sure. Will I still, course. will I still get that gig? Will I still get, will I still people like me, all these different things. So I have that first initially, you know what I mean? And what my lenses have changed, you know? So, so like now sometimes I just see all the little discrepancies or the little like weird or silent oppression. And then I'm just like, I, I want to like rage sometimes and like be angry. Yeah. And, but ultimately like I love to have fun and I am encompassing. And to me, this is the best way through music and, and laughing with my friends still continuing, still continuing to, hang around my multicultural friendship friend group. I have tons of friends from all different walks of life and that continues to stay, like keep me stable and to keep me like connected to the, the bigger picture, which is love. You know, the bigger picture yeah. is, you know, is, is this inclusive world, you know, and, and that, that idea helps calm me down when I'm, when I'm like being poked with, you know, a bunch of like racism or silent yeah. this or like weird things happen, you know, you're a woman, this and all that stuff thrown at you. Like, I'm like, okay, what is that? What's the goal? The goal is to like bring all of it in and then deal with it in that way, you know? Mm. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's beautiful. And, and I'm, it makes me happy to hear that, you know, you've got that system around you because I think that's, you know, I think for any artist that's important, but especially, yeah, good stepping out in those waters, you got to have a solid base Ooh, for you that. You got to be tough as nails and also <laughs> open and sweet. And yeah. Happy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you got to do you got to do polar opposites at the same time yeah. all the time. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. No, it really. Oh, also to be fair with that though, I started taking therapy. So mm. yeah, yeah, it, it, that's uh, that's another big key. I mean, that's. You know, that actually makes me think about a different song of yours, which is Remedy, um, mm. which uh, which I know, you know, I, I would like to let you tell the story, but I know it's, you know, kind of inspired by the death of Juice World mm -hmm. and uh, and everything that happened to him and what the industry does to people. And, and yeah, how it's almost encouraging the, you know, the negative parts of ourselves and the chinks in the armor and really trying to... To make you, now I'm just talking about my own experience, but it's almost like you're led to believe that, you know, whatever you're struggling with is actually what you should lean into in order to to be successful or to be artistic yeah. or, you know, yeah. any of that. What was that like? You know, the, the death of Juice World. did it just hit you really hard and inspire that song? Had you been thinking about this stuff before that? Well, yes, um, there is someone pretty close to me who fits in the same, you know, who looks very similar to Juice World, who I know dearly, who has some struggles, you know, and I feel just kind of how that like went down. I just, it's like a part of me, which is I could have helped that person, you know what I mean? And a, and a part of me witnessing, you know, the, from what I, from what I've seen in the news of how it happened in the plane, in the, you know, in the airport, whatever, yeah. I'm just thinking, why aren't there people, his team of people helping him? And why did they allow for this to ha happen? You know what I mean? So it's kind of a, a thing that happened like simultaneously. Also juice world, even though yes, he was, you know, I feel there is a healthy amount of when you're able to put your, your dark side into your art and share it, that is very healing for a lot of people because yeah. they can connect to it. So, and that, that it was the case in a lot of ways. Um, and it's sad to see for me to see a, another black man die by drugs. You know what I mean? When there are multiple people around his team, he's making millions and millions of dollars for people. Yeah. And, yeah. and they just let him die like off of drugs. And I know he's an adult. I know that. And it's hard to control adults, but like, man, you but know, as, I mean, it's eerie, you know, he was almost, you listen back to his music now. I mean, he was kind of warning us that it was going to happen, was. you know, he was, he was like, like, I think he, he was, was a very good example. You know, I mean, there were, there were a few uh, like Lil Peep is maybe another example yeah. of this, but you know, Definitely. people who, who talked very openly about their, their drug use and their issues, but yeah. they didn't make it sound that fun you know like they they, no. they did a good job of talking about the dark side of it yeah and but even in that like 
some people, I don't know. And that's just us as people. We we're not, we don't know how to take care of each other properly sometimes. Like, because yeah. we're so isolated with our, especially now with internet and just, we don't know how to be tribes people at all. So it's just like, especially in the industry, you know, it's just, it's very exploitive and can be very nasty. And I, I just wish that, you know, that could have shift, we could have shifted that sooner for him. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, no, a hundred percent I do. And I I mean, I'm glad it does seem like more of these kinds of conversations are happening in, in the music industry, certainly in the dance music industry, at least in my own personal experience. I mean, just conversations I'm having with friends and peers, this kind of stuff comes up a lot more, but uh, I don't know. It's, it still feels like it's not enough to me. <laughs> no, it's not. It would, it would take, well, if, it would take literally like the images on TV and how that shift, everything would have to change like psychologically and subconsciously. Like um, Juice World said he started doing lean because of future. So it's like, wow, I didn't it's know like, that. yeah, like he's directly looking at t- TV. That guy looks cool. And then he's now a drug addict when he was probably just a normal teen, maybe, right. could, you know, could have had some maybe more tender, loving care here and there. But like he saw that on television. It was like, I'm going to do that. But so it would take literally the, the big, you know, the big industry itself to literally change the images on television and yeah. internet and whatever. So, yeah. And it's, you know, obviously we can't, we can't change anyone else. We can only change ourselves, totally. you know, that all that kind of thing. I, I will say the younger generation does make me hopeful just because yeah. I think they're a lot more aware of this kind of stuff. I don't know if they're dealing with it any better than, yeah. <laughs> than our generation, but yeah. I think they're much more open about it. And I think yeah. they're seeing some of the effects of all of this. I, yeah. I mean, what was it like? Let's let's take it back. And and on a lighter note, you know, for, for you as a kid growing up, um, am I right that you were from San Jose originally? Yes, mm-hmm. I'm from San Jose. What's, what's <laughs> growing up in San Jose like? Uh, just out of curiosity, because that's a city. I mean, I played some shows there, but I haven't really spent any kind of quality time there. What was it like for you as a kid? Uh, I would say like when I was under 10, like everything was fine and cool. Like, I mean, I did a lot of like, um, my mom put me in musical theater a bunch. There was like a San Jose musical children's theater or whatever. And I was doing a lot of that playing basketball and kind of in a blissful state, to be honest. Yeah. And, um, I realized as I think a lot of teens realize when they're from sort of this, like just boring town you know what I mean where you don't really have any uh cool like a stimulation and like ways to apply your newfound adulthood or whatever like <laughs> yeah yeah not I a think, lot of culture there yeah culture exactly like I think I think it's a place where it's fine but you you can tend to meddle a little bit because because there's nothing to do you know and I think and I think it's a little bit better than some other places. It's not like San Francisco or New York, but, but, um, it could be, it could be boring. And when you don't have like, yeah, like extreme outlets or, or I don't know, just things to do, you know, you can, especially as a teen, you know, you get caught up in a lot of silly stuff, you know, Yeah. but that silly stuff though leads to sometimes, you know, drug usage or it leads to just being naughty and whatever, which is fine. I mean, I, I get like being rebellious and things, but, you know, the, the deeper extra parts of it can get really intense because. You well, know, maybe, especially, especially yeah. if you're a teenager and you're feeling every feeling, you know, 9,000%. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Oh my God. I was so, I used to listen to corn and like, oh, anything too. Posse and like even, Oh, there was some darker, a tool. Oh yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. I, you know what I mean? Like I started oh, Primus Incubus, but the old Incubus when they were like, you know, slapping the bass and shit. Oh yeah. The, uh, yeah. the science album. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I so, loved that album. Yeah. Like, so, I mean, I definitely was into like, you know, I wanted to feel that raging this machine, obviously. Um, yeah. I think music actually probably saved me in a lot of ways and make, made me focus on something bigger. Hmm. Well, um, what was the thought, uh, you know, you say your mom put you in musical theater. So I have mm-hmm. to assume, were you, were you musical from, uh, a young age? Was music something that always really spoke to you that you wanted to be involved in? So I 
first I was really, really shy was not when I was a kid, but there, when I was around people, like my mom took me to New York basically at like eight and I was just standing there, but I was like, you know, always moving and like singing, just like almost like second nature all the time. And then like people would start taking pictures of me and things like that. So like, and I would never understand, I would never understand like why people take pictures of me, but, um, looking back on it, my, I was just always expressing something, you know, and, sure. um, always, always singing. My dad told me that we, um, I, there's like a nine hour drive to Vegas that I sang the whole entire way. And it was just like, they're like, dude, we can't tell her to shut up though. Cause we don't want to like ruin, ruin her, you know? Cause you know, like, you know, eight yeah. or nine, you're just like doing what you do. And then someone tells you you're bad. You're like, Oh my God. So you, <laughs> so you, you know, you, you shut up. But, um, but yeah, I would say that I was always into music, but I, I didn't connect the dots until later in life because I didn't realize like, Oh, I'm singing and that could be something, you know what mm. I mean? I was just like me, just like, well, I'm just being kind of crazy. So. Sure. I mean, did you take any singing lessons? Like, was there formal training at a young age? Um, I would say my formal training came more a little bit later. I mean, to some degree in musical theater, you naturally get some sort of formal training because you have to do warm ups and things. Sure. And you have to, you're dancing and singing at the same time. So you naturally kind of like, kind of go through this process. What was but your, was, sorry, just on the musical theater yeah. note, what was like your first big part in a, in a show in musical theater? Do you remember? I was in Annie. Oh yeah. Yeah. In, yeah. Yeah. And my whole class like came to see it. It was at this big, beautiful theater in San Jose. And uh, yeah, I was like, I wasn't like a main role, but I was always on stage because I was really animated. So the director was always like, get back up there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> yeah. I, so, I did some I did some musical theater in, in high school and a little bit into college. And it was, I don't know. There's something about the environment of that, something about the community feel of like the, the troupe of actors and singers and everybody working together to get the production off the ground. Yeah. That, I don't know. There's something about it now that we're talking about. It. I feel like I, I still kind of try to search that out in, ah. in things I'm doing now. I mean, kind of like when when I, my new performances now, I I kind of like pull from that. Mm. Um, and now that I'm moving, now that we're moving into more stuff, and I'm focusing more on live. Like you know, now I want to have dancers, and you know, I really want to create an experience for people you know, so that people are like, ah, I, I left, you know, feeling whatever way. So. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah, the, the live production angle, I think is, is really interesting. I want to talk a little bit about that too, but uh, going back to, to San Jose for a second, you know, you're, you're doing the musical theater, you're, you're singing, people are taking pictures of you, uh, all that kind of thing. You know, a, as you got a little older, getting into your, your teen years, listening to, to Corn and Tool and Incubus, which yeah. is exactly what I was doing too. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, was, there a, was there a point where it got more serious? Like, was there a point for you where you thought, you know, maybe this is something I, I want to do outside of kind of just being, being a fan or doing it as a hobby? Um, I would say when I got to college, um, I was in the dorms and, um, one of the other RAs came and I was singing around the thing and they were like, yo, I'm a drummer. Like, would you want to start a band? And I was like, start a band. Okay, cool. You know? Um, and then he had a friend who was a guitar player and found another guy who was a bass player. He's like in my class or whatever. And then we called ourselves Mulder's Lounge, which was, um, which was the name of the dorm in oh, San Jose okay, State. Nice. Yeah. Great. And Great. so we would practice, thankfully our, nobody, I don't know, no, I don't know why anyone didn't complain or maybe <laughs> they did, but like I was also an RA. So I, they, I, oh, they couldn't answer to so me. They so they can't say anything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so yeah, I think it was just, that was the time that was a turning point for me because we started practicing and then we started getting really good. And then we started playing like shows in San Francisco and then people having party buses and, you know, the whole experience. And then um, we played it, our, we played our first LA show at the El Rey. So then I was like, oh, okay, I could do this. You know, I could do oh, this. Oh yeah, for, that's legit. Forever. Yeah. 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 That's, that's interesting. Was there a point uh, for you in that band where it, it felt like maybe this is going to be the thing? I mean, if you're going on tour, that's, that's jumping straight in. Well, I, yeah, absolutely. I, I had planned to go to the end with that band. Like I, I thought that was going to be 
like I thought we were going to be the next. The fe- I thought I was going to be the female Zach De La Roca because I was rapping. And, right. and then I also thought I was going to be like somehow blend that with Jill Scott, like, cause my mm. voice is so super soulful. So, um, and it was working, but, but then, okay. Like the bass player got his girlfriend like pregnant and then like, you know, someone wanted to finish college. They wanted to finish college. <laughs> Whatever, like, what? dude. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then, you know, you know, it was just kind of like, we just kind of all split because of, you know, different desires in yeah. life. It's it's and, hard. I mean, yeah. working with other people is hard. Like oh, I think God. we get so spoiled in dance music, especially producers, because yeah. you can kind of just you know, if so, if you're not vibing with somebody, you can kind of just go into your cave and not worry about it. But, totally. Yeah, the band life. I, I mean, I I had metal bands all throughout uh, high school, and it was it's the same thing. You know, just even getting people to show up for practice on a regular schedule is hard yeah. enough. Yeah. Oh, truly. <laughs> yes. And then you, uh, yeah. like liking everybody and everyone's skill set being different, you know. Yeah, yeah, no, of course, absolutely. And everybody's priorities as you get older and, you know, all of that is, is a lot to to deal with. Yeah. Uh, were you, you know, at, in high school with these like interested in metal music, was that like your primary in- interest? Were you listening to all kinds of things? Like how were you finding music back then? Mm. Um, well, I would say my mom growing up, we had a, pretty she had a bunch of albums and they were eclectic from like toto to prince to gospel to you know r&b so like i think that palette having that palette made me like search for more than just like whatever you might think i might listen to you know what i mean as a as a black person so a lot of people think oh you must do you know whatever oh (laughs) you must have sang in church because your voice is really soulful and i actually never sang in church yeah there you go you know um but yeah i think my mom kind of created like a nice you know, Luther Vandross, a nice palette, Shaka Khan of like, you know, being soulful. And then, and then I, um, I don't know. I used to like go into tower records all the time and like, you know, you could listen to every single thing and I would just spend yeah. my time literally just listening to every single, I would stand there for like an hour or two going to every station. And, I um, I, I think it was summer campus when I started listening to like ICP, I think some, someone on the bus like had it. And they're like, listen to this. And I was like, Wah! I was just like, you know, <laughs> going crazy. So I think probably teenage was like, teenage years was like more aggressive and then started to like balance out with a little bit more R&B and just po- oh, pop music. I love pop music. I'm sorry. I forgot. No, how can I, how can I leave that out? Yeah, how can I leave that out? <laughs> I'm sorry. That boys, I went to boys, men to boys, men concert for the first time when Ooh. I was like super young. Nice. And they were like flew over the stage, like <laughs> wow. Okay, Stevie Wonder, um, you know Britney Spears. I went to a, a what's it called Backstreet Boys concert. Nice. Like you know what I mean? Like I, I would say I would have my my. I, I'm influenced by like everything in a lot of ways. So very well rounded. I mean, it's yeah. interesting because I feel like. I feel like that's not a typical teenager. Like were were there no. other kids around you who had similarly wide ranging interests or were you kind of like the, the weird one where it's like, why I is think, he listening to all this? I definitely was the weird one for sure. <laughs> Cause everyone was listening to like Britney Spears and every single pop, anything that was on MTV and like VH1, you know what I mean? Like that's what they're, they're, they're listening to, but I would just be in music stores just like, just soaking it all up. So I think, you know, I think that's where it came from. And yeah, I was definitely the odd man, odd man out trying to like, you know, get these people. To, oh, I'm sorry. One major one yeah, is Notorious go. B.I.G. Notorious B.I.G. Yeah, yeah. I had to hide. I had to hide my CD from my mom because my little <laughs> brother like got into it and like started playing it. And I was like, oh, no, oh, no. no. <laughs> I like, like I like gave it to my neighbor to like hold on to for a week. <laughs> like <laughs> like as if that were going to help. Right. That's yeah. so funny. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's gotta so. be a, a funny moment for your mom too, of, you know, encouraging yeah. you musically so much and then being like, no, 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 not this one. <laughs> yes, exactly. And I used to like recite the lyrics, like press and pause the, um, the CD and like write down the lyrics and then like go in the street, like either at school or in the like little court and like rap it to everybody. Oh, yeah, nice. Whole- yeah, were you all, were you always a performer? Was that a mode you were comfortable in? Yeah, yeah. It's it's really like subconsciously, like not even thinking about it. But yeah, I I definitely um, I, I posted something on Facebook like a year ago about some something cool that happened, and some parent of a kid 
that I went to school with commented and they were like, Oh yeah. I remember when I remember you. Yeah. Kalina you used to be so freaking hyper. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. No. Cool. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's so funny. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, I mean, let's, let's talk about, you know, getting into to college and, and joining the bands. Where'd you go to college? San Jose state. Okay. So you're staying local. Yeah. Did it start yeah. to, did, did being in San Jose, you were talking about how, you know, culturally maybe it wasn't as vibrant as you wanted it to be. And then, you know, you, you went to college there as well. Was there a sense at any point of like, this is a little constraining. I kind of want to get out of here. I want to go do something. Oh yeah, absolutely. Like, um, my third year of college. So it was two years of being a, a R, I'm sorry, an RA, which was really crazy and draining because you're like discovering your early twenties and yeah. also trying to manage other people in their early twenties. Right. You're trying you know to be I mean? an adult and become an adult at the same time. Yo, it's psychotic <laughs> actually. <laughs> yeah. Like they're raging and throwing up in their rooms and you're just like, what? So that on top of uh, playing sports, rugby, and then also being in a relationship and trying to keep up my grades, yes, it all just hit me at one time during my third, my third uh, year in college. And I remember I was sitting in class and I was looking at the teacher and I was just like scribbling. And then I was just like, I couldn't take it. I just had a breaking point and I just got up and I never went back to class. Mm. Yeah. And that was the most, that's when yeah. I felt the most constrained and most like, I will never. And I said to myself, I'll never be back. <laughs> right. <laughs> and you never were, apparently. And I never was. Never was <laughs> oh man. I mean, how did how did that go over with your folks? How, what was that, you know, the next day, the Ooh. next few days? How how was that? Well, I actually hid from them for a while because because I was staying on campus, so I didn't really need to like oh, sure. say anything. You know what I mean? So but then phew, woo! Jeez. <laughs> But then I had to tell my RD that it wasn't going back. So right. I had to figure out how, where to stay. I actually stayed with my friend Christy for, um, for maybe a year. And I'm not sure when I told my mom, honestly. I, it was probably a long while, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I can imagine. I mean, if you yeah. got that time to strategize, that's maybe not a bad, <laughs> bad chunk yeah. of time to take. Yeah. Did you, you know, at the time, I mean, it was a snap decision. Did you know what you wanted to do next? Had you already been thinking about, no. you know, whatever else was out there? No. Yeah. No, I was extremely impulsive. How, how did you figure it out after that? What, what happened next? Um, well, the band thing continued. Sure. Amongst all of that. And that was the thing that actually guided me to LA really. Mm. And, you know, I, and then I, I went to music school here um, oh, okay. or at musicians Institute. So yeah, I would say that the, the band and music became the nucleus of what I wanted. And I was like, okay, like this is a path that I can follow. I literally moved to LA with like $350 or something. And like, I, I was working at Starbucks. So I transferred from San Jose, San Jose one to an LA one mm. only, only to quit a year later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But I mean, that's, that's, that's a crazy time. Uh, I think in anybody's life taking the, the plunge like that, because that's such a moving to LA with a couple bucks in your pocket, trying to make a go of it. You know, that's yeah. like people make movies about that story, yeah. you know? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, okay, my dad helped me with the U-Haul truck, okay? Well, that, that's fine. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that does not change it being impressive as far as I'm okay, concerned. Okay, cool. Right on, right on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting. So you were going to music school out there. Were you playing? I know you play a bunch of instruments. Did mm -hmm. that, was that something you kind of picked up in childhood as well, or did that come along later? Um, yeah, I, I would say halfway during childhood, like, 12 my um I my mom had like a piano in the garage I used to like plunk around on that and then um she'd always be like why are you playing those sad songs and I'd be like oh I don't know <laughs> <laughs> I don't freaking know like I literally don't know right and then, and then I, like, I didn't taking... even know this was a sad song yes <laughs> totally and then um and then I started uh guitar lessons uh, maybe like at 18 did that for a while and then when I started at Musicians Institute, I was going there for the vocal program, but 
I used to just cut class and play drums. It was like a whole thing. I don't know. I just was so obsessed with them. So I just would mm. like, I don't know why I didn't switch programs at that time because I was just obsessed, but I didn't think right. I was like, Oh, I'm a vocalist. I need to stay here. You know? Um, so yeah, I would just do that. And so, yeah, I just double it. Oh, and then producing, I, I learned on my own. I don't know. I just like started learning a little bit of everything to construct songs and express more, you know? Yeah, of course. And then, you know, as the, you know, we talked about the the band splitting up at a certain point and you're out there in LA, you're, you're making it work one way or another. What was, what was on your mind? You know, as the band is starting to split up, maybe you see that on the horizon. Uh, what was the next step for you? Like, how did that, how did that take place? I think it's always interesting to talk about, you know, how people kind of got to where they were. Cause it can, yeah. I feel like there's so many steps before people actually start paying attention you know oh i know oh my god <laughs> yeah i mean i was actually pretty devastated when the when the band uh broke up but also i was so eager to go like i knew in my my body and my spirit that i just needed to get to la you know what i mean and yeah. i think I, i'm so thankful though for that because to have for having those impulsive like feelings and moving for that because i know that a lot of people don't go with their impulses and their guts Right. And even now that I'm a little bit older, like I sometimes find myself being like, Oh, is that going to be good Too overly cautious? And mm. so I'm so thankful for those times where I was just like, I had no plan and I was just going to go. So, um, yeah, so I did that, um, did the music school thing. And then I actually kind of went down into a deep depression after that. And, it, um, just cause you know, finding yourself. Yeah, of course. <laughs> you know? Um, so I, like I got into, I, I think it's just the LA way you get into yoga and be, becoming a vegetarian. <laughs> it's just natural. I literally, yeah. Yeah. You know, um, I started yoga teacher training and I really thought that that was a really strong, I mean, in hindsight, it was very good for me to have that foundation. And, um, but then, yeah, again, music was one of those things that took over. I was in like a, a little girl duo or if you will um we were trying to be the next female or disclosure you know what i mean right so, yeah, yeah 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 so like all these little different like musical things happened but it wasn't really solid it was just like me trying to do something you know? sure well i mean how did yeah. how did dance music enter the picture in the first place because you know we're talking about all these disparate influences and mm -hmm. then you know somebody who just started listening to what you do in the last few years I think mm -hmm. would probably think of you as, you know, somebody who's heavily involved in the dance culture. Yeah. <laughs> like how did that part of it start for you? Yeah. So, so within that whole thing, me trying to be like in the, the, the female disclosure type of right. thing, like that didn't work out. And I literally quit. I was like, forget it. Fuck music. Like I'm not doing this ever again. Yeah. Um, Relatable. And, <laughs> yeah. Right. It's, it's <laughs> hectic. Oh man. Um, yeah. So then I, the next week after I decided that I was working at Trader Joe's and, um, I get a call and my friend was like, Hey, like, have you ever sang over dance tracks before? And I was like, not really, but like, he's like, would you be, would you do it? And I was like, yeah, sure. Whatever. And then, um, I ended up going to Kevin Sunburn's house and we recorded for like 30 minutes and then I left. And then eight months later became the biggest track in 2015. Right. So, yeah. <laughs> that was, that's exactly how I got into dance music. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's that's not a bad way to start. Yeah. <laughs> Which yeah. uh yeah, that's for you know for anybody listening who doesn't know that's the track California with Sunburn. And uh I mean, what was that like to to kind of explode out the gates with that first one? Did was it one of those things where just all of a sudden a lot of people were hitting you up for Oh vocals? my god. Dude. <laughs> Yeah, I've never experienced anything like that before. Um, every every DJ ever was yeah. like from big, small, all over the world. I just I didn't even know how to handle it to be honest. And um, I'd actually get I actually got pretty weirded out or like sad because like I I wasn't used to writing top lines. You right. know, definitely sing, I'm a singer songwriter, so that's a different muscle. And then to have a sort of perfect top line where things are like cut out and there's no, you know, it's like, yeah, you know, whatever it is, you know how it goes. Yeah. So, yeah. Just like a bite sized hook, you know? Yes. And yeah. I wasn't used to doing that at all. So, um, I, yeah, I kind of went to a little, I went like left or, you know, left, left is that way. I went <laughs> left and, <laughs> and, um, kind of went through this odd depression and 
kind of feeling like stuck and I didn't, I couldn't like meet the demands of the people. Not that I needed to, I didn't have to, right. but when I felt a pressure to, you know? Yeah, of course. And, and I mean, did you, did you have anyone helping you any support like on the business side at that time? Because I think when you get a hit out of nowhere and all of a sudden big machines of teams are hitting you up, that can yeah. be extremely overwhelming and hard to navigate. Yeah. Well, initially, um, I did have my friend, um, Andrew helping me and, but even though like the relationship between like, let's what I was looked at at the time is a top liner and how DJs are treated are very differently, di- yeah. different. So I want to are, talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. They're just coming at me, not even seeing me as a human, you know what I mean? Or <laughs> yeah. an artist or anything. They're just like top line. Yeah. I have this song, just like throwing this song. At, I'm like, what? Like, so that, I think that's the the part that really made me depressed for a lot is because the people are like hitting me up, but they don't even know me. And they're like demanding things from me. Yeah. And that, yeah. And so I don't know if I felt as protected or as, you know, until I created, I've created that now, but like initially it really took, it took a lot, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's crazy talking about vocalists in dance music because I mean, I see this all the time from the, from the producer DJ side. I mean, it's so often, and I know I don't have to tell you this, that vocalists, you know, it's, they're treated like second class citizens yes. most of the time when in fact, yes. if you look at, every genre defining song in in all subgenres of dance music it's because of some incredible vocal 95% of the time right yep absolutely and yes it, it's and that's why a, yeah it's, it's such a crazy thing even like the payoff for a dj for for me to come sing a track and for them the payoff's way greater they get to go on tour they get to have their song on the radio like, blah, 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 all these things and me at the time not knowing much getting this like maybe no fee or, or the smallest fee ever with, with percentages or not, you know what I mean? Right. Right. Yeah. It's, it's bizarre. I mean, have you, it's, this is so interesting to me and it's something I think people don't really know about as a casual listener of dance music is how rough it can be for the singers out there and how much harder it can be to get recognition, even just simple things like having your name included on the track, you know, like kind of basic stuff I think can be so difficult. Have you seen it change at all in your time in the industry? Um, it has changed ever so slightly, like, like, like the smallest bit. There's still, there's still so much amount of like, I, I call it training of how people, you know, how people should talk to you or, you know, the, um, yeah, like sometimes I, I mean, I say no a lot, you know, because, yeah. because I hate the feeling of, be, I hate the feeling, you know what I mean? It doesn't feel nice to, for people to just kind of, kind of disrespectfully hit you up a lot. And, and, and people will pester me too, which after I say no, which is, which is very strange to me. <laughs> right. I think that's, that is one of the weirdest things I've experienced is like, I will flat out say, Nope, I don't have. And then they'll just like come back at me every month. That's I think crazy. It, it's actually pretty, I don't get it. Yeah, and I'm like, I mean, it's it's yeah. what you were saying a second ago, right? It's like p- producers almost think that vocalists owe them something. It's so bizarre. Yeah. yeah, and so yeah, I think I think I've created my own boundaries, um, and still, and able to fit fit wherever I fit, and um, not fit wherever I fit. But I'm just saying I've created boundaries, and I my goal now is to try to be in front of these tracks and also perform regularly in these spaces where the DJs are, are my songs are playing, you know what I mean? Absolutely. I I have, thankfully I have been, you know, with Kevin, I've been at like Coachella and and EDC and with AC Slater and literally a lot of people. And that's been great. But now I want to be in front of that and have my own name on the bill and, and be Kalina Zander's the person, not Kalina Zander's the person that's on the people's tracks. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, a hundred percent. I mean, it raises, raises the question. This is something else I wanted to ask you is, you know, do you see yourself as part of any one scene in particular? Because I think the music you make and the tracks you put out, your discography, you know, it's it's hard to categorize. It's hard to pigeonhole, which I think is a good thing. You know, mm-hmm. do you see yourself fitting into any one scene or genre? Do, is that something you even care about? Mm, well, 
it, that's funny. I've been having this conversation a lot lately uh, <laughs> with, with the internals, my mm -hmm. managers and things. Um, well, I, I'm thankful for the dance community because I have never experienced music and that, that feedback, that instant gratification in the way that I do in dance music. So that alone makes me feel very connected and belonging there. And I, I do know that it is, it can be limiting, limiting for someone. You know, I have a big vocal. I can sing ballads. I can sing, you know, all kinds of things I can do. So it's like that can be limiting, but what I'm attempting to do is create an experience, you know what I mean? Yeah. And like, I'm now, you know, you have, you have all kinds of artists, being you can see like uh, what's his name um the rapper uh, dj Khaled is at edc you know what i'm oh, saying right like, yeah 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 it's like uh travis scott is at edc you know what i mean like it's just more about and i want what i'm trying to convey to to mainly mainly industry people is that i'm a i'm a personality i'm a i'm a, I'm a you know person who's putting out stories right. you know like for instance i just made a mini film um of my own my own journey and the music isn't straight four on the floor, but it's electronic sounding, but I just don't want to be pigeonholed to be like, where do I put this? It's like, I'm an experience. Just how every Fisher, he's an experience. Yes. I know he's, he's doing tech house, but everyone, all of these people are just people that people love. So, mm. and that's the angle that I am hoping to shift with other people. You know? Yeah. I, I mean, I love that. I think yeah. that's, you know, we, you mentioned earlier some of your influences talking about, you know, some of the biggest pop musicians in the world. And I think that's regardless of how they're viewed. I mean, that's what they do, right? Is, you know, you, you kind of never stick to one sound or one style. No, that's what I tell them. <laughs> I say this all the time. I was like, pop music. I was like, they, some, a pop person's making a rock song one day and then they're making a dance track and then they're making a jazz track. I was like, I'm telling you, like there are no, there actually aren't any real like genres per se. It's just how it's presented. You know what I mean? Sure. Of yeah. course. Yeah, no, it's it's so interesting to think about that kind of thing. And did those experiences, you know, you mentioned Coachella and EDC and and Ultra and all of that. Did going out on those big stages and having those big performances, did it spark any ideas for you of kind of how you want to present what you're doing? Because I, I think like on those festivals and people who have listened to the podcast before know, I, I kind of give big festivals a hard time sometimes because it can feel kind of just very same e, you know, where it's just yeah. like over and over and over. It's like, I sometimes can't even tell which DJ is on stage, you know? Totally. Yeah. And, and so hearing you talk about, you know, coming out, being, being the front person of it is super exciting to me. I'd love to hear, you know, how those experiences shaped what you're thinking about, what you're planning on doing, anything you want to share. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, it's, I just have to say they are, they have been some of the most incredible experiences for me being my first one at Coachella with sunburn was 33,000 people, you know, looking out and just under the Sahara tent and just like going crazy. You know what I mean? So like that is like a drug and something I want to create my own community with, you know what I mean? What I'm starting to do in my sets, my first, I, I would say my first real festival set in in a little, like in the past was I think 2019 at snow globe. And I have like a, a DJ and a guitar player. His name is Ray, who I did, who I collab with, with remedy. And so we kind of go out together. So I almost like, I'm, it's almost like I'm a hype woman for my own set and singing. Right. And then like, you know, you have the DJ and then he'll like bust out his little guitar. You know what I mean? So, um, it's kind of like that experience and I'm just like hyping the crowd and then like, you know, I don't know, just kind of like that in general. And then recently I've been adding in um, a bongo player. Okay. And so uh, that's a whole nother really cool dynamic. And um, it's kind of nice because he picks up the percussion in the, in the, in the tracks and it's really, really cool. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's definitely make me, it made, it's made me think bigger and lets me know that I can go to those places on my own in a way. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, especially if I stay, within the dance community, regardless of whatever music per se, um, if I stay within the dance community because it's so open and loving and because people already actually know who I am because of these experiences, because they've seen me, my, uh, they've seen a face to the voice, you know, they're, they're more apt to come to my own set and sure. which, was, which will definitely be that same 
experience. And every time I, I go out, people are always like, oh my God, it was so crazy when you came out. Oh my God, you were the best part of the set. Oh, you know, people love that. So yeah. Yep. And it's like, yeah. well, hey, why not have the best part the whole time? <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. And um, and I love crowd participation. I get people involved, you know, like I'm very like performer, performer, but I would like yeah. to do it in the dance space because I love the community. Yeah. I, I love that you keep using the word community because that's something I always try to push as well that I think can get lost in sort of the modern era of, of really commercialized, you know, like take an EDC or something, 400,000 people, you know, it's it's so mainstream now that I think what community really means can get lost a little bit. Yeah. Because I think it's very easy for people to, you know, hear a term like plur or something and, mm -hmm. you know, to to kind of misunderstand what that means and to not understand that community doesn't just mean that we're all here having a good time, but it also means if you're part of the community, you have to contribute to the community and take care of the community, right? Yes. Yeah. That's what, that's what our song, my song that I have out right now with LPGOB, Carry Us is about. Yeah. Can we talk about, I love that song. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I, that that song to me, what I like about it, and this is you tell me if I'm wrong about this, but every time that, that the whole song is like an adrenaline rush to me because there's all these points where I think other songwriters and other producers would sort of build the energy and then pull it back. But I almost mm -hmm. feel like it just never pulls back. It just like mm -hmm. each time just keeps ratcheting up the energy, which I love. Yeah, no, that's exactly what it was intended for, you know. It's kind of funny because it, it's one it's one of those songs again where they kind of kind of came out of nowhere. You know what I mean? Like I get these like sort of like premonitions or like these like flash forwards of like feelings, and that, I guess that's when they make the hits, baby. That's when they make the hits. That's <laughs> <laughs> when you don't have to think about it, baby, it just comes to you. That's right, baby. Um, but yeah, no, it, it literally was one of those things where um, LP had had the track, and we had been working on like one version of it. And then I was in the studio with her. I was like improving, you know what I mean? It wasn't even really like a, at, not at first. It was just like this, this like sort of transcendent thing that just moving through me, God, universe, whatever. And I was just like, I don't know, just had these moments. And, and it just like turned into, you know, creating like, you know, words and, and creating an experience of, of uplifting gospel style, even though like, it's weird because like, like I, I'm not religious at all, yeah. really, but I love gospel and it's ingrained in me by default. So, and, and LP has a strong love for soul and gospel too. And I don't know, it just like some, some divine thing just kind of came out and it was just like, carry us. And I was thinking of like the world, like us, us, you're, you're carrying someone else, you know what I mean? It's us together in this carrying each other, mm. you know? So that's, that's literally what it is. And it has, it has, it's like almost like praising the the essence of who we can possibly be, you know? I, I love that. And I mean, if, if we can get weird for a second here, yeah. I, I related to something you just said, because I, I was never, I wasn't raised particularly religious. I'm not a religious person in my adult mm -hmm. life, but you know, you talked about channeling something or, or that divine feeling, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Is that something you think about as far as, you know, the nature of creativity when you have a song that comes to you and you don't know where it comes from? Like, do you, are, are you a spiritual person? Would you say that? I, I would say, yeah. Like whatever you think that a spiritual person would be, I am that. Yeah. Like yeah. I am tuned in to like, for instance, I love sounds and birds. You know what I mean? Like, if you go on a, if you were to go on a hike with me, like I would constantly be stopping because I just hear all of the nature sounds. I love sounds. That's you know so I, mean? I, love... I do the exact same thing. That's yeah. Oh, cool. <laughs> oh, cool. That's yeah, great. 100%. Yeah. So like, to me, all of that is just like the fact that you can hear that through all of the, your mental chatter and the stuff you go through on a daily basis to me, lets me know that there, there is the divine like movement and energy around you that always to tap into, you know what I mean? Yeah, and yeah. 
Yeah. It's interesting. I mean, it's really interesting to think about. I went so I went to college for music, but it was kind of a it's like a snooty experimental music kind of program that has very almost nothing to do with dance music. But one of the things that always stuck with me was that, you know, some of those early electronic music composers from the 50s and 60s, what they were really interested in was expanding the definition of what is music. Mm-hmm. And, you know, some of them would just take a, a field recording and, you know, mm. release it or process it slightly mm. as a piece of music. Yeah. Or, you know, there, there's early composers who would just do a concert and it would just be them with like six radios on stage, just tuning mm. radios. You know, all, mm. the, all these things to, to sort of expand what we think music is. And, and I, what I, to connect what you were just saying to me, that's the same thing of going out into nature and hearing the sounds and being like, well, actually, this makes me feel the same way. It makes me feel just as strongly as if I hear a powerful piece of music, right? Yes, yes. And, and heal, like, I feel what like is he- that feeling? Yeah. 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 Healing and some sort of peace. And I, I love, you know, sunlight, all of it. To me, nature is divine and, and healing and God, if you will. You know what I mean? Or any kind of spirituality. I, I just animals. I don't know. I just, we all are really, you know what I mean? Yeah. But I think sometimes humans are a little bit lost, you know, but yeah, no, it's weird. We're like the, the lucky, we're like the luckiest animals, but we don't usually realize that, right? Yeah. No, not at all. (laughs) Yeah. Not at all. So yeah. (laughs) <laughs> well, I, I love all of that. But uh, before we wrap it up, I want to bring it back full circle to the Reload Remix EP that, yes. that just dropped. And we were listening to some of it. We we're going to listen to some more. And just talking about some of the artists you you got to remix Reload on this. How did you pick these artists? How did you meet them? You know, what, what comes to mind if I throw that question at you? Yeah. So, well, Vendata... We actually did a track in 2015 uh, called Gypsy. It was their first EP on Ausla. That's right. And I forgot about yeah. that. Yeah. So they, we've been friends for for a long time, and so I reached out to them, and they're like, "Yeah, let's let's do this." And you know, I, I told them about the concept of you know showing you know pe- people of color together, and you know, reloading on love and having this message of you know, continuous message from, from brown people, you know what I mean? Yeah. And they were, they, they loved it and they made this wonderful, like cool, slick, you know, um, remix. And then, um, 12th planet, I actually got connected to through AC Slater. I was like nervous to, to ask because, you know, like, I don't know. Yeah. 12th planet. No, of know, course, like, such a legend. I, yeah. Did you know him beforehand? Um, no, I, I've, I've seen him around, but like not know him. No, no, not at all. So, um, or I mean, have I seen him? Oh, I saw him one other time. Like, oh yeah, backstage we were at some festival with AC actually. Yeah, he's just the sweetest guy, Twelfth Planet. Oh yeah, so super kind, super just like awesome. And um, yeah, I was all nervous, and I like I texted him. I was like, hey, can we jump on a call? You know, and and then um, turns out he knew knew who I was, and he's like, I'm a big fan, and he's like, I've always wanted to work with you, and I was like, really? I'm like, I was like, you could have hit me up anytime. I would have been like, yeah, like let's do this, you know. So it was like a mutual, like beautiful, like respect for each other. And so, I, and I told him about it, and he was like, oh my god, this is awesome. So um, that was uh, Twelfth Planet, and then Lee Wilson. Lee Wilson, he's um, an awesome, amazing singer songwriter and remixer, beat producer, concept conceptualized and queer, and so, and I am too. So we like. I don't know. I saw him on like the cover of crate diggers at one point and I just been following his path and, um, I just hit him up I hit him up. I was like, what's good. And <laughs> just, <laughs> we just went back and forth and like, he just, he made an outstanding, uh, remix with, uh, John Paul lakes. And it's, it's really cool. It's like Chicago. He like, yeah, I like so a lot. Cool. Ooh, it's, it's really cool. And then Rel, I've always, I follow him on, um, Instagram, I always see his his post. He's very energetic. He feels very similar to the kind of energy that I put out. So um, I hit him up and just kept talking to him. And dude, that Jersey Club remix oh, is man. insane. It's he ridiculous. added like he added like gunshots and then like just like looped the like face down on the pavement, 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 <sighs> so pavement. So crazy. Ooh, 
I mean, like a, yeah, that that remix might be they're they're all very good, but that might be my favorite is Rails. It's it's like intense, but you want to rage and dance to it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, whew, it's insane. Um, and then uh, Coil. Coil is a longtime friend of mine. We make a ton of music together, and he actually is the OG um, creator on. Um, the, the original he's one of the oh, okay original. great yeah and so um i asked him i was like i would love it if you would um recreate your own version what you what you would do you know what i mean yeah so, which is sort of like an underground like kind of like dark and sexy you know like percussiony you know sound and which i actually love i love all of them I yeah, no, I that. do too. It's a really yeah. diverse and and I feel like usually with remix packages, especially in the dance world, it's like there's one or two that are kind of the 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 good ones, right? Mm-hmm, and then there's mm-hmm. a, a few that are just tacked on. But this really, truly didn't feel that way. And I, I was also impressed by that. Oh, good. Awesome. Yeah, yeah no, good, 100%. good. That's good to know. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and, and am I right as well that, you know, the proceeds are going to charities as well for yes. this EP? yeah. So um, divers- Diversify the Stage is for people of color and queer people and kind of creating spaces for them to perform and to really elevate in the music space and the music industry. And it was started by uh, Noelle Skaggs from Fits in the Tantrum. And, oh, amazing. Um, yeah, yeah. And I, which I actually got to talk to her, which is really nice. Um, she... She had posted Carry Us on her story. Oh, wow. And then, and then um, LP, GOB, like, I guess made the connection with me and her. And I talked to her and I was like, oh my God, because, you know, it's like, it's, it's fits in the tantrum. Oh, so they're like, incredible. You know, yeah. That's, I, I'm actually a little, ju- I, I've done, <laughs> uh, I did a remix for them a few years back, but I've still never talked to or met any of oh, them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know. It's, it's wild, right? How, yeah. how you can do things for people and never know who they are. Never, um, never. <laughs> yeah. And then she posted about Reload, the remixes, and she like put my name on there. And I was like, oh my God, you know, I was like, she's like, she said she was a fan. So I was like, oh my God, I'm a fan. So, um, so that was really cool. And uh, also the National Bailout Fund is the, the next one. And that is for um, women specifically who are wrongfully in jail, you know, and, and this is a fund for them to, to get out of jail and, and help pay for their bailouts. Amazing. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm, it's, it's so cool. You're doing that. I would highly encourage, uh, we'll put some links to both of those, both of yes. those funds, those charities in the, the show notes when this drops as a podcast, all that. And I would highly encourage people to, to donate to that. The, uh, the diversify the stage charity too. I mean, I'm so, I've been looking into them a little just because I saw you were donating to them and mm-hmm. it, it looks like an incredible organization. It's something I go on and on on this podcast about of how, you know, dance music uh, uh, more or less was was built off of the creativity of... <laughs> Black of, and queer people, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, <laughs> yeah. not white people, right? Yeah, and, yeah, but yeah. then, But then you look at these stages, these festivals, all of that, and it's, you wouldn't know it, right? I and know. Yeah, it, it's just, a, I don't know. It, it's a thing I go on and on about. We don't have to get too deep, but... <laughs> but that's another reason for doing this package. I mean, that's what I'm saying. It's like, this we started by, you know, queer and Black folks and people of color. And like, it just needs to be equal, but it needs to turn it back to being equal again, or, you know what I mean? Like, and I hope, I literally hope, this is my dream, is that every year I can release um, a remix package from another set of black and brown queer folks. You know what I mean? Yeah, and absolutely. We, I mean, it yeah. was almost, it, it was almost, it, this is, I guess, a sad thought, but you know, when you drop that, well, today it dropped, but when I saw that you were doing it, it it was surprising to me because I hadn't seen people do that before in, in this mm-hmm. world, you know? Mm-hmm. And then I had a thought that like, actually that's a sad, it shouldn't mm-hmm. be surprising, you know? Yeah. yeah, right? Yeah. I know, I know. It's it's kind of weird that it's, uh, I think I even mentioned it before in some other, like some blog that now it's seen, it seems an anomaly or shocking the shock factor to see a black person thrive in this space is kind of, you know what I mean? It's just like, it, it's kind of like, it's sad. It is sad. 
Yeah, it, it absolutely is. <laughs> exactly. And again, it's I, I always connect this with sort of the mainstreamification of dance music and how, you know, in the last 10 years, it's had this crazy explosion and some of the roots have gotten lost. But I really do hope, like during the pandemic, you saw lots of people, at least in the artist community, talking about like, well, they, we can reset and, you know, lineups can change and all that. And I don't know. I, I think for any anybody out there listening who's involved or wants to be involved, up and coming yeah. artists, anything like that, like you can't wait for other people to change it, right? It's like you can't yes. just hope no, it into yeah. existence. Yeah, you got to keep pushing. You got to keep pushing. You got to keep creating, like creating community involved, like consciously take the effort to look at somebody and say, oh, yes, I'm going to incorporate this person or whatever. Because a lot of it is con- is subconscious and just conditional. And yeah. we're not even thinking about, not even thinking, we're just doing and we're allowing for our subconscious to pick the things that we like. You know what I mean? So that that it takes an awareness and, you know, a switch on to be like, to consciously be like, oh, I'm going to choose a person of color for this role today. You know, yeah, what I mean? you know yeah. What I mean? like, absolutely. And it's, uh, it sounds, it's so crazy because that sounds so easy, but it's, you know, the inertia is a real thing, you know? Yeah, it really is. Yeah, like, exactly. <laughs> and, and, you know, I'm not, I, I'm certainly not saying that I'm, I'm the vanguard of, of anything. You know, there's been times especially the first few years of this podcast, even I look back at just everyone I had on and mm-hmm. I was like, wait, this doesn't look right. How did that happen? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, it's mm-hmm. like, it could, I, I think it can happen to anyone. So I would, I, it's just a call out to everybody to keep trying to be conscious about this Aware. kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah. And it's it maybe even simple as writing it down and like, setting a timer i don't know you know what i mean just like yeah. a little no a hundred percent yeah <laughs> like like concrete changes i mean yeah practice <laughs> yeah practice practice mm-hmm. that's absolutely right and i i mean I, i'm just glad you're out here doing it the the music is incredible the ep is great um it's great Thank to you. see you like on spotify playlists on the cover you know like oh. taking it back to singers instead of producers all of that like Thank you. I'm, I'm just really glad you're out here changing this stuff and, and showing people it can be done. Thank you, man. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> oh, a hundred percent. Thank you for seeing me. Thank you for seeing me. And thank you for like, I, I, I just know sometimes I feel like I'm behind a wall and I'm just like, just going to attack everything. You know what I mean? And you have no idea of really how things are being perceived and, I really appreciate that feedback. It can feel like you're, you're out on an Island a lot of the time doing oh, this. All the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know, we were talking about, we mentioned earlier, like new music and, and plans and goals and live shows. And as things are, are opening back up, you know, what's, what are you excited about right now? What are you working on? What goals do you have? What should people be looking out for? I'm really, really excited about this short film that I put together, like a whole, the whole side of me, there's a whole side of me that really loves um, radio, television, and film. That's one, that was my major. And um, I love how like Michael Jackson used to bring storylines to, um, to music. And I, I miss that a lot. Everything is so quick on the internet. And yeah. I know, I know artists are trying to, I, I can see it happening. Like Tierra Whack is a, a wonderful example of bridging, um, you know, arts and, um, I'm sorry, arts, not arts, but movies and, you know, music. So I miss that culture where that was always the focal point. And, um, I want to bring that back. I want to be the, I want to be the lesbian Beyonce or like the, the, the lesbian Michael Jackson, you know? Yeah. <laughs> that's, I love that. <laughs> that's, that's how, that's where I'm thinking, you know what I mean? Like big picture, you're, you're going to watch like some cool, it'll be my story, but it won't just be like on the DSPs. It's going to be some, something you can see and feel, you know? Right. So that's well, what I'm I love that. For. That's like, uh, I know you jokingly at one point called yourself the EDM Whoopi Goldberg. Oh, yeah, and yeah. To, to take that from EDM Whoopi Goldberg to lesbian Beyonce, I think that's yeah. a great progression. <laughs> Let's go, you know, like, no, like, I don't know. I just, I just got this whole determination and like, I don't know. My eyes are big and I, I like this awakening and I'm ready to like do whatever is necessary and called, you know, called. Cause I'm like, I know what, I know what it takes. I'm not afraid of it. And I want to just explore and share, you know, and, and, um, the start is, is the creative talents I've been given. And I want to just keep peeling back the layers to create a better, better, you know, job or a better experience or whatever. So yeah, 
Yeah. Well, what can you talk a little bit about the short film as much as you're able to share? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, so I so it's taken inspiration from um, the Truman Show. Did, did you see that? Yeah, yeah. Truman yeah, yeah. Show meets like Pleasantville. Um, it's about like the sort of perfect, you know, life that we all, that we live. I'm sometimes in a, in a perfect relationship. I've been in a long relationship for like 10, 11 years. And sometimes it is, it, it just always feels like constantly, this is great. But then, <laughs> but then inside, I'm just like, Oh, I want to do so much, you know, and yeah, there's a lot of temptation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of things. So th- that's what the story is about from told from, the reason why the lesbian part is so important is because I don't really see lesbians talking about their long relationships and how it can be, um, how it can be just like a hetero heterosexual relationship where you deal with all these different, you know, problems or, right. you know, challenges of trying to stay together. And why do you stay together? You know what I mean? So, well, there's very few representations of that in the media in general, I think. True. True true like like and for good or bad it's just there's I, I don't see a lot of that anywhere totally totally so yeah so I, I i i'm trying to not trying to be i mean i feel this sort of calling and this bold feeling to like to share from me being a woman and being with another woman and to see that i don't you know a lot and i i i i, I think there was a christmas a christmas holiday happiest holiday or something that mm. came out during Netflix and that was pretty big, but I just want it to be no- normal. I want to yeah. normalize, you know, a lesbian experience basically. Yeah, always, absolutely. We know the gay experience. We know a lot about that. We know like even the clubs in WeHo are all gay guys, but where are the lesbian culture that is like put up in a place where we are just normalized? So, yeah. Well, and I, I'm, that's awesome that you're putting that out there. Not only that you're just existing in the space, representation and, and all of that, but yeah, a movie like that, connecting it to the music. I think that's, that's super valuable. Is that kind of, is that your next project? The next thing people should look for from you? Yes, that's next on the list. However, I'm, I will be releasing some singles, some hot fire singles. Um, we're still working out the kinks on who the collab person is, but I, I know who it is, but we just have to, you know, yeah. But, um, yeah, there's some really hot fire drug. Like, whoa, (laughs) like, like, I can't believe that this happened. So, um, that's exciting. Yeah. Uh, I'm stoked. I'm stoked. I mean, in all of this, like what, as we're kind of wrapping this up, like what is, what is the most, you know, we've talked about a lot of weighty things, I think, today. But what is what is the m- most fun part of what you do? What What is exciting to you? What's enjoyable to you? What's like, w- what do you just get stoked to do in your career right now? Right now, currently, okay. So being being back in quarantine has, has made me fall in love with creating, like, lyrics again. Mm. And, like, and being in the studio with other people again, like, in, like, I can't, it's weird to, I know that seems simple, but there, sometimes that kind of becomes routine and mundane and you lose your, like, you lose your steam or you lose your love for that interaction. But like, I am so like, I'm a very busy person, but I am so stoked to create again and like actually like create and manipulate sounds and words to create something completely new because I have such a new inspiration and I've gotten a lot of like self like for instance, this EP, which is the visual EP with the movie that got, I got a lot of like stuff out. And so right. I'm so eager to see what I've learned through the whole process to see what will come out. You know what I mean? Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah. That's like, yeah, I, I like the way you put that is to like, let's see what comes out of me. And maybe that will actually point to what's changed in me or how my thought process has changed. Yeah, exactly. It's like, that's a really interesting way to self-analyze. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah. I mean, because music can do that, right? It can be a time capsule. You look back and y- you can hear a piece of music, and either you remember what was going on at the time in your life, or even you can look back and be like, "Oh, like I was in a weird place back then." Yeah, huh? totally. <laughs> and, I, and I have a tendency to hold on to emotions uh, for fear of maybe saying too much sometimes, or fear of like it could be the wrong thing, but like I don't know. Yeah, saying too much or whatever. But um, I'm ready to release all the things that I've that I have because it, I need to gut out my internal whatever whatever it is, you know. Right. And also, I think it helps you when you're able to communicate out loud what you need or want or 
your art, like you actually learn and you like grow up a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. And, and to take it full circle, when we were talking about Juice World and all of that, I, it's interesting because I think as, as an artist, we're kind of taught that if you fix what's wrong about you or if you figure it out, that somehow your creativity is going to be lessened or you'll oh, be I less know. interesting. When in fact, it's the total opposite, right? Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yes. So many people have that like, oh, I, I can't stop smoking weed because it's what makes me you know, yeah, it's creative. How I create, man. Yeah. yeah. Or I, I, or I have to keep doing this thing. I have to keep breaking up with this girl because. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, I because, can only write when I'm sad. Yeah, I need to be heartbroken. Oh my god, we're just tortured souls. That's what it is. <laughs> what the heck? I'm over that. I'm no, really that's the whole that. thing. And I think once you get over it, whatever, whatever it is, any individual is dealing with, it's like a fog lifts, right? It's like none of that. Yeah. I, the creativity is always there. It's just yeah. sometimes it's harder to access. Totally. Yeah. 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 It could. It can be hard depending on. It could be like, you could be hungry, you could be hungry, you could be sleepy. You know, there's like <laughs> yeah. very basic things of why like you're not creating today. But I think like ultimately we just have to learn how to like take it easy on our, and for our brains, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. And just know that it's there, you know, yeah. it's like for anybody, if you've ever had a good idea, that's all you need. If you've had one good idea in your life, yeah. that means you can have a good idea. You know? Yeah, totally. Like, if it's not there, it'll come back. Yeah, totally. I always say that it, for if for some reason I passed, I mean, it's like, like kind of dark, but if I passed away today, I would be totally fine with like all the things that I've done. Like I'd be mm. like, that was sick. I lived a sick life. You <laughs> I know killed what I mean? it. Yeah. <laughs> I killed it. I did, I did some shit. I was on TV and shit. Like, duh, like, bye. Like everything else I'm doing now is just like extra. You know what I mean? Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. And that's right, man. There's so much we didn't even get to talk about, you know, you being on TV and the, the Olympics and oh, Super the, Bowl, yeah. the yeah. Super Bowl and, and all of that. Yeah, just casual. <laughs> we can just sprinkle that in there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, okay. Last couple questions and, and we're out. But uh, we talked about, you know, getting back on the road, touring, live shows, all of that. You know, where, where's your head at for that? We talked about how, you know, it's kind of time for you to, to be the, the front person on the stage. Yeah. Should people be looking out for live shows some point later this year, 2022? Yeah. Um, I have a show. Um, well, I am doing like a lot of, uh, like club stuff, like yep. day trip and Zomniac stuff, but I do have a show in Boise, which is pretty cool. Oh, shout um, out to Boise. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they, they had their pride event, pride event, um, in, uh, September and I'm doing a show for, we found new music in October. Um, but, but, I am looking for an awesome agent, like someone who's like really understands and can see, you know, see me. Um, yep. Yeah. Looking for like someone who can help me elevate, really just book me. And that's all I need. I just need to be booked because I know how to do this performance thing. Yeah. Know? Yeah. That's not going to be a problem. <laughs> yeah. 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 I'm good to wrap me up, wrap her up. Yeah. Throw her out there, you know? <laughs> but I love that you said, and, and again, because I, I think we have a lot of aspiring people, list, aspiring artists listening to this show, that you got to find someone who understands what you're trying to do, right? Somebody who gets yep. it. Mm -hmm. and, and that's so much more important than somebody with connections or somebody with True. power. You just got to find the one person who gets it. I think that's that's always the key. So I love that you said that. True. Yes. And yeah. exactly what you said. <laughs> yeah, hundred percent. All right. Uh, so last thing, this is the question I ask at the end of each one of these interviews. And it's kind of just, it's a simple like first thing that pops in your head kind of question. Just looking for a, a memory, a moment, a time in your life, and it could be from any time when in a single moment, music really had a deep impact on you, really affected you in that moment. And that's meant to be a super broad question. There's kind of no wrong answer. I know the moment, actually. Let's go. Um, yeah, so it was at... It was at LA Pride, to be honest, uh, 2019. That was a pretty significant like show turning point and made me realize like I need to be performing consistently. Um, so I was on one of the outside stages and not the main stage or whatever. And it was like early, it was like early, maybe like one or two. And like 
right before I got up, like not too many people were like, you know, gathered around, whatever. And so I, I like came up, started doing a little vocalizing on the DJ set right before just to like introduce uh, something. And sure. then, um, and then slowly, slowly, not even actually, not even slowly, but once the music started and I started singing, people started rushing over like, and, and it's like, a, you know, <laughs> blocks, you know, block party type of thing. So like, and then like, it seemed like thousands of people. I don't know. It was like a sea of people. I was looking back right. and then I was just like, wow. I was like, wow, that's powerful because like literally nobody was here cut to a sea of people. Like that to me was like life changing. And I was like, Oh, okay. I get it. I think I should be a singer. <laughs> <laughs> right, 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 right. And, and it's such an incredible feeling to be like, Oh, I have power. Like there's, yeah, you know, this, this good. simple thing that I, that I do all the time. There's so much power in it yes. when it's presented the yeah. right way. Yes. And so that actually was a huge turning point. And I've actually been trying to not trying to get back to it. I think I've had many uh, wonderful experiences after that, but like, how do I create that my own show experience like that continually mm. and not ex get, not get exhausted? Cause that's, that's, that's a, huge a thing. whole nother, whole nother mm -hmm. thing. Yeah. 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 As, a, as a singer doing a whole show, that's, I don't know, mm -hmm. even just doing this podcast, I lose my voice all the time. It's, oh, it's yeah. hard. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Stamina. Like we're, Obviously, I guess I have to work out. <laughs> yeah, you know? whatever. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, I love this whole conversation. Thank you for taking the time to do it. You you feel good? Is I feel great. Right? Good. Thank you. Thank good. you. No, yeah. thank you so much. That was great. Uh, shout out to, to everybody in the chat. Shout out to Teddy. Yes. I Hello. know that was your question earlier. I, I meant to shout you out earlier. And uh, yeah, Kalina, thank you so much. This was thank awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna listen to some of your music right now. Is there any any track you want to uh, start us off with? Anything we should Ooh. start with? Um, I would say just go ahead and do that rail remix, okay? Okay, let's just go. go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> just do that one right here. That's perfect. <laughs> All right. Well, take care. Have a great day. It's okay. great to talk you to you. Too. Okay. All right. Take care. Bye.